Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy from Kaili Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belgavi. Today we will be talking on the gross anatomy of the stomach. Before we go on to actually study the gross anatomy, let me ask you to go through a clinical case scenario. A 35 year old female came to OPD with complaint of recurrent burning sensation in the epigastric region radiating to the back. It begins shortly after having food and aggravates on lying down. It is not relieved on taking antacids and the diagnosis made was of a peptic ulcer or a gastric ulcer. Just keep this in mind so that as we go through the lecture you would know why these symptoms have developed and what is the cause of these particular symptoms. Now we would be discussing the stomach under these headings introduction, location, shape, capacity, parts, ends, borders, surfaces, relations, peritoneal relations, visceral relations, structures forming the stomach bed, interior of stomach, blood supply which would include the arterial supply and the venous drainage lymphatic drainage, nerve supply and the applied anatomy. Now stomach also known as the gaster from which we derive the adjective gastric. What is it? It's the widest part of the elementary tract. It's a temporary reservoir of food and it's a muscular bag with a variable capacity. What we see here are the various regions of the abdomen. We see the stomach which is situated majorly in the left hypochondriac region, epigastric region and the umbilical region. So when we talk of location, the stomach is located in the left hypochondriac, epigastric and umbilical regions. It is fixed at the upper and lower ends but varies in shape in normal, obese and in very thin individuals. And that is how we have three different types of shapes of the stomach. Normal individuals are said to have a sthenic type of the stomach which is J shaped with an obliquity towards the left. Whereas in very obese individuals, the stomach is very much oblique, nearly horizontal in orientation and that is what we call as hypersthenic or a steer horn type of stomach and these type of obese people are more prone to get duodenal ulcers. As opposed to this, the third type is called as hyposthenic or asthenic type of stomach which is seen in very thin individuals wherein the stomach is nearly vertical in orientation and these individuals are prone for peptic ulcers. So that's how we say three different shapes of the stomach, sthenic, hypersthenic and hyposthenic. The capacity of the stomach. The capacity varies between 30 ml to 50 ml in a newborn child whereas at puberty it is about 1000 ml and in adults it is about 1500 ml. Let us now see the parts of the stomach. As is shown here 
the stomach has got two ends the superior end is the cardiac end whereas the inferior end is the pyloric end it has got two borders the right border also called the lesser curvature and the left border which is called the greater curvature and it has two surfaces that's the anterior surface and the posterior surface the parts of the stomach if we draw a horizontal imaginary line starting from the cardiac notch and going towards the greater curvature this dome shaped area which is lying above this imaginary line is what is called the fundus of the stomach if we see the lesser curvature there is an indentation there which we called as the angular notch or the incisura angularis a vertical imaginary line joined from here going towards the notch on the greater curvature demarcates an area which is known as the body of the stomach whereas the part of the stomach inferior to this imaginary line is what forms the pyloric part of the stomach so there are three parts of the stomach fundus body and pylorus the pylorus measures about 10 cm in length it has got an upper dilated part called as the pyloric antrum which measures about 7.5 cm and it has got a distal narrow tubular structure which is called as the pyloric canal which measures 2.5 cm in length and that is what leads to the pyloric orifice moving on to studying the features of the two ends the upper end or the cardiac end of the stomach it lies about 2.5 cm to the left of the midline of the body it is about at the level of the t11 vertebra measured about 40 cm from the incisor teeth and it is situated about 10 cm posterior to the anterior abdominal wall the lower end or the pyloric end lies about 1.25 cm to the right of the midline it's at the level of the lower border of l1 vertebra and it lies about 4 cm posterior to the anterior abdominal wall thus it is obvious that the cardiac end lies more posteriorly as compared to the pyloric end of the stomach it also lies towards the left while the pyloric end lies towards the right thus when we talk of the two surfaces of the stomach we talk of the antero superior surface and the postero inferior surface moving on to the two borders the right border or the lesser curvature whereas the left border or the greater curvature the greater curvature is about 4 to 5 times more in length as compared to the lesser curvature so these are the parts of the stomach two openings two borders two surfaces three parts fundus body and pylorus pylorus further divided into pyloric antrum and pyloric canal that's what said here two ends cardiac end pyloric end three parts fundus body pylorus made up of pyloric antrum and pyloric canal borders greater curvature lesser curvature and surfaces anterior and posterior surface or to be more specific antero superior surface and postero inferior surface the two openings the cardiac and the pyloric are guarded by sphincters which are the pyloric sphincter and the cardiac sphincter moving on to the relations of the stomach peritoneal relations of stomach the peritoneal coverings related to the stomach 
are called as omenta. Along the lesser curvature of the stomach, we see attachment of a bilaminar fold of peritoneum called as the lesser omentum. This lesser omentum can be traced from its attachment to the liver coming down and getting attached to the stomach and some part of the duodenum. The attachment of the lesser omentum to the liver is a J-shaped attachment attached to the porta hepatis and to the fissure for ligamentum venosum. From there, this bilaminar fold of peritoneum comes down towards the lesser curvature of the stomach, is attached to the entire lesser curvature and also goes on to get attached to the proximal 1.5 centimeters of the first part of duodenum. Hence, this lesser omentum as is seen here can be said to have two parts, a hepatogastric ligament and a hepatoduodenal ligament. When these two layers of lesser omentum reach the lesser curvature, they split and enclose the anterosuperior and posteroinferior surfaces of stomach respectively and again meet at the greater curvature of the stomach. From here, the peritoneal folds have a different orientation in three different directions. From the fundus part of the stomach, this bilaminar fold of peritoneum goes towards the diaphragm and that is what is called as the gastrophrenic ligament. Subsequently, from the greater curvature, the bilaminar fold of peritoneum goes towards the hilum of the spleen and that is what we call as the gastrosplenic ligament. From the remaining part of the greater curvature, this bilaminar fold of peritoneum goes down towards the lower abdominal area folds on itself and comes back as the greater omentum. It is also called as the gastrocolic ligament. It has got four layers. Layer number one and two which goes down folds on itself and comes up as layer number three and four and goes right back to the posterior abdominal wall. Thus as it is seen here between the layer number two and the layer number 3 is a space which is nothing but the omental bursa or the lesser sac of peritoneum. Thus, we see that peritoneal relations of the stomach include the lesser omentum along the lesser curvature, the gastrophrenic ligament, the gastrosplenic ligament and the gastrocolic or the greater omentum along the greater curvature. This greater omentum is having a lot of fat deposits in it and also plays a major role in preventing the spread of infection from the intestinal coils. Thus, it is also called as the police guard of the abdomen. This shows the structures attached to the two curvatures. Attached to the lesser curvature is the lesser omentum having two parts, the hepatogastric ligament and the hepatoduodenal ligament. Whereas attached to the greater curvature is the gastrophrenic ligament, gastrosplenic ligament and the greater omentum. These are the peritoneal relations of the stomach. Moving on, this is a picture shows us the attachment of the lesser omentum, the two parts of the lesser omentum and what we see here attached to the greater curvature is the greater omentum. Another view to show us the greater omentum, how it has spread over all the coils of small intestine like an apron and covers these coils from the anterior aspect. This as we said is a four layered structure. 
if we lift up it has got three borders it has got a well demarcated right border inferior border and left border like an apron it can be lifted up so once we lift up this greater momentum we can see the posterior most layer of greater momentum that is the fourth layer to which is plastered the transverse colon and more posteriorly lie these coils of small intestine that are covered by the greater momentum those were the peritoneal relations of stomach now there are certain areas of the stomach which are not covered by the peritoneum and these are what are called as the bare areas of stomach so entirely there are three bare areas of the stomach bare area of the stomach seen as a triangular area on the posterior surface near the cardiac end it is related to the left crust of the diaphragm the left suprarenal gland and the left gastric artery this is the bare area of the stomach apart from this there are two more areas which are not covered by peritoneum and that is the area along the lesser curvature where the two layers of lesser momentum split as well as the area along the greater curvature a point where the two layers fuse and then go as the gastrophrenic gastrosplenic ligaments and the greater momentum so these are the three areas or three parts of the stomach which are devoid of peritoneal covering and thus called as the bare areas moving on to the visceral relations of stomach we study these as the anterior relations and the posterior relations anterior relations of the stomach are formed by the left lobe of the liver quadrate lobe of the liver diaphragm and the anterior abdominal wall in a completely empty stomach the transverse colon will also be seen as an anterior relation this is a picture which shows us the anterior relations of the stomach formed by left lobe of liver and part of the quadrate lobe of liver then a large area which is formed by the diaphragm and an area which is directly lying behind the anterior abdominal wall these three liver diaphragm and anterior abdominal wall form the anterior relations of the stomach and in case the stomach is completely empty then yes the transverse colon also forms an anterior relation posterior relations of the stomach are formed by the crust of diaphragm splenic vessels the spleen left kidney left suprarenal gland pancreas transverse colon and transverse mesocolon all these structures are separated from the stomach by the lesser sac or the omental bursa and that's why these structures are said to form the stomach bed this picture shows us the structures which form the stomach bed or the posterior relations of the stomach it includes the diaphragm the left kidney the left suprarenal gland the splenic vessels the pancreas the transverse mesocolon and the transverse colon all these structures which are there just behind the omental bursa form the stomach bed the spleen is also seen as a posterior relation of the stomach but it does not form the part of the stomach bed because the spleen is separated by the greater sac from the stomach so only the structures that are separated by the omental bursa from the stomach form the stomach bed spleen is not a component of the stomach bed this is a cross section through the stomach bed anteriorly what we see here is the right free margin of the lesser omentum which contains the portal vein the 
bile duct and the hepatic artery. When we trace it from here towards the stomach, this is the lesser omentum. When it reaches the lesser curvature, it splits to enclose the stomach from the anterior aspect as well as the posterior aspect. The two layers reach the greater curvature, reunite and then proceed as the gastrosplenic ligament towards the hilum of the spleen. What we see here is the spleen. From the hilum of spleen, the linorenal ligament going towards the left kidney. Posteriorly, on the posterior abdominal wall, we see the left kidney, the great vessels, the iota and the inferior vena cava and the right kidney. This entire area which is seen behind the stomach, separating it from the left kidney is the lesser sac or the omental bursa. So, it is very clear here that the spleen is separated from the stomach by the greater sac whereas the other structures which form the stomach bed are separated from the stomach by the lesser sac. This is another picture showing us the same. Anteriorly we see the stomach, behind it what we see is the omental bursa, the spleen, the kidney, the abdominal iota, inferior vena cava and the right kidney. So this is the omental bursa which separates the stomach bed from the stomach. Moving on, let us now see what is the TROPS space. The TROPS space is a quadrangular area which is seen on the anterior surface of the stomach. On percussion, we get a tympanic note in this area. Now, what are the boundaries of this TROPS space? It is a quadrangular area bounded on the right side by the left lobe of the liver. It is bounded on the left side by the spleen. Superiorly, it is bounded by the left lung and inferiorly, it is bounded by the left coastal margin. What lies in this space? The fundus of stomach lies in this space. The fundus of stomach contains some amount of ingested air at all times and it is this air in the fundus which gives a tympanic note on percussion. There could be a loss of this resonance. In what all conditions do we see that? This loss of resonance occurs either due to a massive splenomegaly or a left sided pleural effusion, an enlarged left lobe of liver a pericardial effusion or a full stomach. Let us now see how the interior of the stomach looks like. When we open up the stomach to see the interior, it shows a number of irregular mucosal folds. These irregular mucosal folds are called as gastric rugae and when we see these with a magnifying lens, we can see the minute openings of the gastric pits which are seen on the surface of these gastric rugae. These rugae are seen all along the surface of the interior of the stomach except along the lesser curvature. Near the lesser curvature, what we see is longitudinally oriented mucosal folds. And these longitudinally oriented mucosal folds are called as canals of Magenstress. They are useful in directing the flow of all the liquids and fluids which we ingest so that they directly enter into the duodenum. That is how the interior of the stomach looks like. Moving on, let us now see the blood supply of stomach. The stomach is derived from the foregut. Hence, it is supplied by the artery of the foregut which is the celiac trunk. 
the arteries supply both the surfaces of the stomach. They give rise to three types of plexuses. The subserous plexus, the intramuscular plexus and the submucosal plexuses. From the submucosal plexus, a number of mucosal arteries arise which anastomose freely. Along the lesser curvature, the submucosal plexus is absent. So, the mucosal arteries arise from the intramuscular plexus. The blood supply, the arterial supply of the stomach is done by five main arteries. And those are the right gastric artery, the left gastric artery, four to five short gastric arteries, the right gastroepiploic artery and the left gastroepiploic artery. Let us see now how these arteries originate. What we see here is the abdominal iota giving out one of its ventral unpaired branch that is the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk is a very short vessel and immediately divides to form its three terminal branches and those are the left gastric artery, the splenic artery and the common hepatic artery. The left gastric artery travels upwards up to the cardiac end of the stomach, turns on itself and comes down along the lesser curvature. The point where it bends to turn down, it gives out a few esophageal branches which ascend up and supply blood to the lower part of the esophagus. The splenic artery travels posterior to the stomach, is a part of the stomach bed and goes towards the hilum of the spleen. Just before entering the hilum of the spleen, it gives out four to five short gastric arteries which supply the fundus of the stomach. It also gives out the left gastroepiploic artery which enters the greater omentum and supplies blood to the upper two-thirds of the area near the greater curvature on either side. The common hepatic artery gives rise to the hepatic artery proper the gastroduodenal artery and the right gastric artery. The right gastric artery enters into the lesser omentum, supplies the part of the stomach on either side of the lower part of the lesser curvature and anastomosis with the branches of the left gastric. The gastroduodenal artery goes behind the pyloric antrum and gives out the right gastroepiploic artery which enters the lower part of the greater omentum and supplies the lower one third of the surfaces of the stomach near the greater curvature. The right gastroepiploic artery anastomoses end to end with the branches of the left gastroepiploic artery. Thus we have seen that these five vessels the left gastric, the right gastric, the splenic which gives out the short gastric arteries, the left gastroepiploic and the right gastroepiploic arteries. That is how they supply the blood to the stomach. The same is seen here in this picture. So, let us revise it. The celiac trunk giving rise to the left gastric and the splenic. The common hepatic giving rise to hepatic proper, gastroduodenal and right gastric. So, we see the left gastric and the right gastric anastomosing in the lesser omentum. Splenic on its way before entering the hilum of spleen giving four to five short gastric arteries for the fundus part of stomach and also the left gastroepiploic artery. The gastroduodenal giving the right gastroepiploic, both the gastroepiploics taking care of blood supply along the greater curvature 
and both are a content of the greater omentum. So, that explains the arterial supply of the stomach. Moving on to the venous drainage of the stomach. Same named veins will drain the blood from the stomach with only one major difference. The gastroduodenal artery does not have a counterpart in the venous system. The vein which is seen in the venous system is the pre-pyloric vein of Mayo which travels anterior to the pyloric antrum. All the other veins have the same names as the arteries. So, what is seen here? This is the left gastric vein which receives the esophageal veins that come from the lower part of the esophagus. This is the right gastric vein. The short gastric veins 4 to 5 draining the blood into the splenic vein. The left gastroepiploic vein draining its blood into the splenic vein. Right gastroepiploic vein which drains the blood into the superior mesenteric vein. So, what we see here is 4 to 5 short gastric veins draining the blood into the splenic vein. Left gastroepiploic draining into the splenic vein. The splenic vein travels behind the stomach, joins with the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein. Right gastroepiploic vein drains into the superior mesenteric vein. Prepyloric vein of Mayo drains its blood into the right gastric vein. Right gastric vein drains into portal vein. Veins draining the lower part of the esophagus drain into the left gastric vein. Left gastric vein in turn drains into the portal vein. Thus the entire venous drainage of the stomach will ultimately go into the portal vein. Same is so shown here in this picture entire venous system draining the stomach. So, what we see here is the short gastric veins draining into the splenic vein, the left gastroepiploic also draining into the splenic vein. The splenic vein on its way to the formation of the portal vein receives inferior mesenteric vein, ultimately joins with the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein. The right gastroepiploic vein directly drains its blood into the superior mesenteric vein. The left gastric vein receives the veins that drain the lower part of the esophagus and drains into the portal vein. The right gastric vein also drains into the portal vein. Moving on, let us see what is the lymphatic drainage of the stomach. The Lymphatic drainage can be divided into various areas. Areas draining the right two-thirds of the stomach and the left one-third of the stomach. The left one-third can further be divided into the upper one-third and the lower two-thirds. There are various groups of lymph nodes which are seen around these specific areas which will ultimately drain the lymphatics into the celiac group of preaortic lymph nodes. These lymph vessels have free anastomosis, but vessels have valves which direct the lymph in such a way so as to form watershed lines. All valves direct the lymph towards the celiac group of lymph nodes. Now, let us see these various groups of lymph nodes. What we see here around the fundus part of the stomach are the short gastric lymph nodes. These receive the lymph from the upper one-third of the left part of the stomach. Around the spleen, around the hilum of the spleen, we see the splenic lymph nodes. More inferiorly, near the greater curvature, we see the left gastroepiploic nodes and the right gastroepiploic nodes. 
just inferior to the pyloric antrum, we see the pyloric group of lymph nodes. Anterior to the pyloric antrum, we see the gastroduodenal nodes. Superior to the pyloric antrum, we see the hepatic group of lymph nodes. Along the lesser curvature, from superior to inferior, we see the left gastric nodes and the right gastric nodes. These nodes drain the blood from the respective areas and ultimately drain the entire lymph into the celiac group of lymph nodes. It is important to note here that the lower part of the esophagus lymphatics are drained into the left gastric nodes. That means the lymphatics of esophagus drain along with some lymphatics that drain the stomach. This does not occur at the inferior end of the stomach. The lymphatics which drain the duodenum do not intermingle with the lymphatics draining the stomach. That is the reason why carcinomas of the esophagus are commonly seen along with that of the stomach whereas the carcinomas of duodenum are not seen along with that of the stomach. Another picture to show the various lymph nodes which are there around the stomach. So near the fundus, the short gastric lymph nodes along the hilum of the spleen, we have the splenic lymph nodes, the right and left gastroepiploic lymph nodes along the greater curvature. Just below the pyloric antrum are the pyloric group of lymph nodes. Above the pyloric antrum, the hepatic group of lymph nodes the right and left gastric lymph nodes and ultimately the celiac group of preaortic lymph nodes related near the celiac trunk. So these all include the various lymphatic groups which are seen responsible for draining lymph from the stomach. Moving on, let us see the nerve supply of the stomach. The stomach receives both sympathetic nerve supply as well as parasympathetic nerve supply. The sympathetic nerve supply arises from the thoracic segments T5 to T12. They are carried through the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves via the celiac plexus. What do they do? They are vasomotor. They are inhibitory to the gastric musculature. They are motor to the pyloric sphincter. They carry afferent pain fibers and also the sensation of distension. The parasympathetic fibers are carried by the two vagus nerves. They are secretomotor to the gastric mucosa and motor to the gastric musculature. They are responsible for coordinated relaxation of the pyloric sphincter during the process of gastric emptying. The anterior vagal trunk ramifies on the anterosuperior surface and gives off the hepatic branch and a branch to the pyloric antrum, whereas the posterior vagal trunk ramifies along the postero inferior surface and additionally gives out a celiac branch. The same is seen here in this diagram. The anterior vagal trunk ramifying on the anterosuperior surface and giving off a hepatic branch and a pyloric antral branch. The posterior vagal trunk ramifies on the posterior inferior surface and gives off a celiac branch which goes towards the celiac nerve plexus. Now we go on to the applied anatomy part. The first point which we should know here is acute gastritis. This is caused by the inflammation of the gastric mucosa leading to hypersecretion of hydrochloric acid which gives rise to increased amount of gastric acid secretions. These are seen to manifest as gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers also known as the peptic ulcer disease. What are the causes of this peptic ulcer disease? It could be due to helicobacter pylori infections. 
the caffeine excess intake of caffeine seen in coffee excess ingestion of spicy food or because of excess intake of alcohol how do you differentiate between the gastric ulcers and the duodenal ulcers the characteristic symptoms of both these types of ulcers are different in a gastric ulcer the phenomenon which is seen is a person takes in food experiences pain vomits the food and is relieved so it's food pain vomiting relief while in duodenal ulcers the pain is felt the person takes in food and is relieved so it's pain food relief that's how we can differentiate between the gastric ulcers and the duodenal ulcers the treatment of these ulcers is by the drugs if left untreated these ulcers further erode the mucosal surface and can lead to perforation and that will give rise to the spillage of the gastric contents into the entire peritoneal cavity which will in turn give rise to peritonitis that is infection of the peritoneal cavity gastric ulcers are mostly seen on the anterior surface of the stomach nearer to the lesser curvature why because the mucous membrane is less mobile here there are absence of submucosal plexus and the gastric canals are present along the lesser curvature a characteristic treatment for these ulcers was in the form of vagotomy surgeries wherein there was a surgical ligation done to the vagus nerves there are three types of vagotomy procedures truncal vagotomy selective vagotomy and highly selective vagotomy in a truncal vagotomy the trunks of the vagus nerves were ligated this led to post operative atony of the entire stomach and that led to a problem with the gastric emptying thus the next step was to do a selective vagotomy wherein the specific nerves of latargate of the vagi were ligated this led to decreased motility of the pyloric antrum and that in turn had problems with the gastric emptying time which was prolonged not is done nowadays is a highly selective vagotomy where the specific nerve endings of the acid secreting areas of the stomach are ligated these are the three types of vagotomy surgeries the truncal vagotomy the selective vagotomy and the highly selective vagotomy the next point is displacement of the stomach the stomach has its two ends which are very much fixed in their positions and thus is unlikely to get displaced in a normal condition in conditions like hiatal hernias wherein the stomach can either have a sliding or a rolling herniation through the opening if of the diaphragm and that's how the stomach gets displaced into the thoracic cavity through the esophageal opening in the diaphragm so two types of diaphragmatic or hiatal hernias either a rolling hernia or a sliding hernia where part of the stomach is going to be seen as a part or a content of the thoracic cavity another point or another way of displacement of the stomach is in the form of volvulus of stomach volvulus is wherein an organ or a viscus is going to twist or turn around its peritoneal relation volvulus of stomach can be of two types an organo axial valvulus or a mesentero axial 
volvulus organoaxial volvulus is wherein the lesser omentum the gastrospinic ligament and the gastrocolic ligament are under chronic lengthening due to the traction of the other organs around the stomach that is what leads to the volvulus it's the most commonest type of volvulus of the stomach the organoaxial volvulus whereas the mesenteroaxial volvulus is wherein the two ends of the stomach the cardiac end and the pyloric end are not fixed they get mobile they come towards each other and that is what leads to the volvulus formation this is a lesser seen variety of volvulus of the stomach the next point is a congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis this is a congenital neuromuscular incoordination which is seen due to the thickening of the circularly arranged muscle layer of the pyloric sphincter because of this thickening of the circular muscle layer the pyloric opening is stenosed or is narrow and this narrowing leads to progressive vomiting which is seen in the infant the infant will have the milk and will progressively vomit it out because of the pin point opening of the pyloric orifice due to the thick circular muscle layer once diagnosed this stenosis can be surgically operated and treated gastrostomy in cases of esophageal obstruction this surgery that is the gastrostomy is done so that a feeding tube can be introduced into the stomach the gastrostomy is done through a triangle that is a gastric triangle this gastric triangle is bounded by the left lobe of the liver the left coastal margin and the transverse colon it's a triangular area wherein the stomach directly rests on the anterior abdominal wall so an opening made through this gastric triangle can easily access the stomach through which a feeding tube can be inserted so that the nutrition is given to the patient it's done in cases of the narrowing or obstruction of the esophagus next is the barium meal examination this is a radiological examination done to visualize any filling defects of the stomach a suspension of barium sulfate is given to a patient to be swallowed after doing all the preparations the patient swallows the barium sulfate solution and later a x-ray film is taken which delineates the interior of the stomach so any growths on the mucosal surface are picked up by the barium meal x-rays endoscopy also known as ogd scopy esophageo gastro duodenoscopy wherein an endoscope is introduced through the oral route passing through the esophagus goes into the stomach up to the first and second part of the duodenum it sees or visualizes the interior of the esophagus stomach and part of the duodenum it is done to visualize any mucosal defects ulcerations as well as mucosal growths or tumors can be very easily picked up by the endoscopic procedure stomach wash tube or a gastric lavage in cases of poisoning the toxic contents of the stomach are removed by this process a gastric wash or a gastric lavage tube is introduced through the oral cavity and passes through the esophagus into the stomach 
and that is what helps in taking out toxic materials from the stomach and that is called as a gastric lavage or a gastric wash. The trousseous sign. In cases of the carcinoma of the stomach, the left supraclavicular node is enlarged. So, this is a sign that if we see enlargement of the left supraclavicular node, this could be because of a primary malignancy in the stomach. The CA of the stomach, as I have said, can involve the esophagus because they have a common or a shared lymphatic drainage. But it does not involve the duodenum. The CA of stomach is most commonly seen as growths or tumours along the greater curvature. A referred pain from a stomach infection is taken up by the T6 to T10 dermatomes and thus is felt at regions which are supplied by these dermatomes. Operative procedure for carcinoma of stomach that is gastrectomy and gastric lymphadenectomy. The process of the lymph node infiltration or involvement of the lymph nodes in a case of carcinoma stomach is classified as three types N1, N2 and N3. In the N1 variety, only the loco regional lymph nodes which drain the tumor mass are enlarged. In the N2 variety, the regional lymph nodes draining the entire tumor area are enlarged. Whereas in the N3 variety, all the neighboring lymph nodes of the anterior abdominal cavity or the upper abdominal cavity are enlarged and infiltrated. So, three varieties of classification based on the lymph node involvement. The classification based on the lymph node groups which are excised along with the gastrectomy are also of three different types. They are known as the D1, D2 and D3 types. In the D1 type, it is a partial gastrectomy which is done wherein only the tumor mass along with the surrounding tissue is excised and only the regional or the local lymph nodes which drain the tumor are excised. In the D2 variety, the entire stomach total gastrectomy is done along with all the lymph node groups which drain the stomach along with the spleen are excised. Whereas in the D3 type of gastrectomy, the total gastrectomy is done along with a radical lymphatic excision of all the upper abdominal lymph nodes is done. So, three varieties of gastrectomy and gastric lymphadenectomies D1, D2 and D3 based on the tumor growth and lymphatic infiltration. That covers up most of the applied anatomy aspects of stomach. So, to summarize, what all did we do today? We started off with a case scenario. We went on to the introduction of the stomach where we saw the location, the shape, the capacity of the stomach. We went on to see the various parts of the stomach the openings, the borders, the surfaces. We moved on to see the relations of the stomach, both peritoneal as well as the visceral relations. We saw the interior of the stomach, the arterial supply, the venous drainage, the lymphatic drainage, the nerve supply of the stomach and then we went on to go through the various applied anatomy aspects of the stomach. So, this covers up the entire gross anatomy and applied anatomy of the stomach. Thank you.